Hello, I'm John Cobb, President of Charleston Federal Savings Loan Association. The 1982 West Virginia University football season was truly a season to remember. The opening game victory over Oklahoma, a near miss in Pittsburgh, a postseason appearance at the prestigious Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, Florida, and our second consecutive 9-3 and three season. Charleston Federal is truly proud to be a part of West Virginia University football, and as part of our continuing support of the Mountaineers, we are pleased to bring you this film of the 1982 football season. season started in Norman, Oklahoma, and ended in the top 20 and the Gator Bowl. Records fell, victories mounted, and the West Virginia Mountaineers gained the respect of football fans everywhere. In the Mountain State, the pride grew into an enthusiasm like nothing ever seen before. The 1982 Mountaineers had a season to remember. Presented by Charleston Federal Savings and Loan. In two seasons, Don Nealon had amassed 15 victories that laid the foundation for a solid, lasting program at West Virginia. But this was to be his test, an obstacle every Saturday to be met by a team with a number of question marks. Going into the 1982 football season, the, the coaching staff here at West Virginia was nervous to say the least. Uh, as you know, we lost Oliver Luck, our great quarterback, and he had accounted for almost all of our yardage offensively. We also had lost most of our fine offensive linemen, and we knew we had to re completely rebuild our offense. Nealon and his staff found answers quickly. Any college football coach will tell you defense is the name of the game. And the Mountaineers had plenty in store for opponents in 1982. There was Pally on the outside, Folks on the inside, and Campbell up the middle. This tremendous trio, all seniors, was responsible for holding foes under 14 points a game and for allowing 12 different teams, many of them national contenders, to convert less than 30% of their third down attempts. Darrell Talley is one of the greatest football players ever to wear the old gold and blue. Only time will tell, but one thing for sure, outside linebacker may never be played the same. He came to West Virginia, a gangly prospect from Cleveland. He left a six foot four inch hulk. Talley ran faster than most of the backs, hit harder than any lineman and played with more intensity than words can describe. A consensus All-America selection, West Virginia's first since the 50s, Pally is a sure bet for professional glory. But Pally had help on defense. Help from Dennis Folks and Todd Campbell, two more senior muscle men. Folks was all over the field from his inside linebacker spot containing the sweep, stopping the draw, and picking off passes whenever he could. And Campbell had a penchant for sacks, quarterback sacks. He will be remembered as one of the best pass-rushing linemen at WBU in many years. This was a stingy defense, forcing opponents to pick up almost 194 yards before surrendering a touchdown. It was an opportunistic unit as well. West Virginia defenders intercepted 24 passes, an average of two a game, and recovered 16 opponent fumbles. WVU's turnover margin was the best in all of the NCAA. However, the real job of moving the ball fell on the offense, and there were surprises everywhere. With Oliver Luck now an alumnus, the quarterback spot was the biggest hole to be filled on this side of the ball. But Nealon and company found an offensive bonanza in a young man they call Hoss. J. 
Jeff Hostetler, a junior who had transferred from Penn State, hadn't taken a snap for nearly two years. His first action came against an Oklahoma team very similar to the whirlwind that had dismantled the Mountaineers in 1978. As the coach turned around to face them, he said, when you play this game, boys, you've got to play it right. You've got to know you can hold them. No, you can hold them. No, you can throw the ball. No, you can run. You never count your losses. Till the last down is over, there'll be time enough for counting when the game is done. So they went out and won. Again to face those mighty Oklahomans and the map there and then with the passing on the run. And somewhere in their hearts, his young men found the courage. And when the final score went down, then you the save one. You got to know you can hold them. No, you can't fold them. No, you can't throw the ball. No, you can't run. You never count your Hoss had a lot of help, too, from players like Mark Rowell, now established as the best pass catcher ever at WBU. Rowell set a single-season record in 1981 with 61 receptions, then pulled in 32 more last year, giving him a career total of 123. He had a knack for making the clutch catch, and even two defenders had a tough time handling him. Last year I caught 61 passes, this year I caught 32. I think the key reason is that the, the receiver core balanced itself out. They grew, they matured, they had more confidence in themselves. And I think there was more than one guy this year could catch the ball, and the coaches had more confidence than more than one guy. Other offensive standouts included the interior linemen, who rarely get the attention they deserve. Seniors Andre Gist and Dave Johnson led a rushing attack that gained almost 140 yards a game, just enough to keep defenses honest. Every Saturday before a game, we know that we have to do certain things, and when we do those things, we are given uh, certain percentage points, and what we try to do is accomplish 80% or better each game. That is that we are proficient enough in our position to win that game. And in those nine victories, you can see that if you go down through the offensive line, that we had players grade out at over 80% each of those games. Senior Curlin Beck paced the team in rushing, picking up four and a half yards every time he touched the ball. And fullback Ron Wolfley powered his way to 323 yards and two touchdowns. The Mountaineers also put the foot back into football during the 1982 campaign. Sophomore kicker Paul Woodside kicked an NCAA record 28 field goals. He also established a national standard with two or more field goals in 10 games. And he successfully kicked 23 of 23 field goals attempted under 40 yards. Woodside now owns three national records and 11 WVU marks. Uh, all of last year and then, and then again all of this year has been like uh, some sort of a fantasy for me. I never even thought about any of the r records or anything. My main concern was that if I were in a game, I just wanted to help out the team any way possible. Another exciting aspect of West Virginia's special teams was the return prowess of Willie Drury. A sophomore, Drury thrilled a national television audience 
with a 75-yarder against Rutgers and again finished among the national leaders in both punt and kickoff return. There was talent at every position, and as the season progressed, the pride of this team translated into victory after victory after victory. Following their stunning upset of the highly talented Sooners, the Mountaineers returned home to face a hard-nosed Maryland team. Before a Mountaineer field record crowd of 56,000 plus, West Virginia prevailed 19 record to 2 and 0. Victory number three came a week later against Richmond, when the Mountaineers piled up 466 yards in one of their most impressive offensive showings of the year. This set the stage for the annual Backyard Brawl, a date in Pitt Stadium with the top-ranked Panthers. ABC was in town bringing millions of TV viewers with it, and they were treated to what many have called the best game in all of 1982 college football. The Mountaineers led 13-0 after three quarters, but the Panthers came roaring back on the arm of Dan Marino and the hard hitting of a staunch defense to forge into the lead. In the game's final seconds, Paul Woodside calmly stepped forward and tried his longest field goal ever in an attempt to tie the game. A pit defender heard the ball scrape the crossbar as it fell just short. So near, yet so far. The center was perfect, the hold was perfect. I just, because I wanted it so bad, I didn't, I didn't really get under it enough. And I knew as soon as I hit it, it was going to be, it was going to be a matter of feet. I just didn't know which way. Boston College was next on the Mountaineer slate, and the Eagles were fresh off a stunning upset of Texas A&M and a tie with the 1981 national champion Clemson. Bowdown BC gave West Virginia all it wanted and more. Play of the special teams making the difference. In the waning moments, sophomore Tom Bowman pounced on a fumbled punt reception inside the BC 10-yard line. Hostetler sneaked in over the right side, and the Mountaineers were 4-1. There was no rest for the team, which had to prepare to play at Virginia Tech, one of the toughest paths facing any West Virginia football team. This squad rose to the occasion, and with three Woodside field goals, prevailed 16-6. WVU was 5-1, and, and coming home to play host to Penn State. The Nittany Lions came to town riding the wave of early season success that would eventually lead them to the Sugar Bowl and the National Championship. The Mountaineers' final total exceeded Penn State in every category except one. That one was found on the scoreboard as West Virginia was frustrated by a 24-0 loss. Team bounced back to win its final four regular season games, displaying the kind of enthusiasm and desire that had propelled it into the national limelight. The first of four came over East Carolina 30-3 in Morgantown. Deck, King Harvey, and Woodside all had great days in the triumphant effort. But the hero of the day was Kevin White, rushed into the starting lineup to replace a battered Jeff Hostetler. White moved like a seasoned veteran, earning cheers from over 50,000 faithful in the stands. Next came back-to-back -back road games with Temple and Rutgers, always tough opponents, always giving their best. White again started for West Virginia and let a valiant come from behind effort that produced a 20-17 victory over Temple. Included in Kevin's afternoon was a 68-yard bomb to Rich Collins. One of the prettiest plays of the season. After this game, Nealon and his staff had less than five days to prepare for a Thursday night encounter with Rutgers at the Meadowlands. The game was beamed to America by a cable television, and Willie Drury electrified the nation with his running. After falling behind 10 to 7, West Virginia exploded on its way to a 44-17 route of the Scarlet Knights. Hostetler returned to the lineup, 
looked a little rusty, although he threw for 186 yards and two scores. Both came to Rich Hollins, the newest West Virginia long threat. The final regular season contest was set against old nemesis Syracuse, a team that had become Don Nealon's spoiler at WVU. In 1980 and 1981, Syracuse showed up last on the schedule, but first on the scoreboard, winning the season finale both years. The Mountaineers were not to be denied, icing the cake of a proud season with a 26 to nothing shutout. West Virginia was 9-2, its best record in 12 years. This little gator sticker that I have here is, symbolically is the invitation to play in the Gator Bowl, the 30 eighth Gator Bowl, and I'm going to put it on your shirt right there and officially extend you that invitation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll wear it with pride, I guarantee you. In accepting the bid from Gator Bowl officials, this West Virginia team made history. At no time in the history of West Virginia football had the Mountaineers gone bowling two years in a row. Preparations for the Gator Bowl began in Morgantown. But the football operations moved to Florida just before Christmas. The players and staff spent Christmas Day enjoying Disney World. The warm Florida weather disappeared on game night as neither the skies nor Florida State cooperated with the Mountaineers that December night. More than 30 million people watched the game on national television and another 80,913 in the Gator Bowl, the second largest postseason bowl crowd, saw these two teams battle it out in a driving rainstorm. While West Virginia suffered a 31-12 defeat, Willie Drury set a new Gator Bowl record for the longest punt return, an 82-yarder early in the third quarter. The hard-hitting play of free safety Tim Agee earned him a national reputation and a share of player of the game honors. Don Nealon has a lot to look forward to in 1983. He's got a bona fide offensive weapon in Paul Woodside, sure to be everyone's All-America kicker this fall. Jeff Hostetler is back and is likely to become West Virginia's strongest Heisman Trophy candidate ever. The receiving core is as strong as ever, led by Holland, Gary Mullen, and Wayne Brown. Don't forget Willie Drury, who will line up at wideout as well. On the defensive side of the ball, West Virginia's secondary will be second to none. Steve Newberry could become WVU's all-time leader in interceptions, coming off four thefts in 1981. Tim Agee has earned the reputation of being the hardest little hitter in all of football, and he's sure to get better with the new year. All in all, there's a lot to look forward to in 1983. The schedule includes traditional showdowns with Pitt, Penn State, Temple, and Rutgers, as well as a trip to Florida to tackle the Miami Hurricanes. All in all, there are a lot of new memories to look forward to in 1983.